Good day everyone. This video lecture talks about module 4, which is powers of the mind. So when we hear about this, you might think that what you will learn here would be about mind reading and magic tricks. But technically, what you will learn here would be about the brain, its functions, its importance, and even the dysfunctions. So for our objectives, at the end of this module, um, you will be able to discuss that understanding the left and right brain theory is very important in improving one's learning. Secondly, you will be able to, to explore the different parts of your brain and their functions. And of course, you will be able to differentiate the different brain-related disorders. So um, the first thing that would come to our minds, of course, when we hear about the brain is not the slimy organ, but its importance in learning. When we define learning, um, it is a relatively permanent change in behavior brought by experiences. So let us try to sort the different unfamiliar terms in this definition. So relatively permanent change. So meaning if you have done a certain behavior that uh, in which you benefited from it or you have, um, you have gained something from it, or you had a positive feedback from it, of course, that behavior is more likely to be repeated. But um, if you were punished for a certain behavior or you had a negative feedback from it, that behavior is unlikely to be repeated. So any changes brought by maturity is not learning because maturity is genetically controlled. So um, growing up, having some changes in the body like menstruation, having body hairs, or growing tall is maturity. So another term that we should remember is experience or experiences. So these are the events and activities in your life that you have engaged in. So question, does it have to be your own experience before you can learn? Of course, no, because some are results of observation. So we learn from merely observing or from the experiences of other people. That's why we have the term vicarious learning experience. We learn from other people uh, through their experiences or by merely observing them. So another question is that, do we need to learn how to learn? Of course, the answer is yes. So we all have the capacity to learn as a person or as an individual, but not all of us could learn effectively. Some people are very bookish. Some people are good in memorization. Some are good in cramming. But we have to remember that learning is not automatic. So we really have to invest our time and our effort for us to be able to learn a certain material. So secondly, no learning will happen if a person is not motivated. And thirdly, not everyone knows how to learn effectively. So effective learning only happens when you are an active learner. So you really have to, to, to learn not only with your eyes, not only with... Uh, reading alone, but of course, you, you have to listen and you have to understand a certain material before you can learn. Okay, so the human brain is a sponge-like structure. It is actually pink gray in color and it's only three pounds, so about 1.2 kilos. Though it is not a very attractive organ, but it's a marvelous organ because it works 24 hours a day nonstop. So even if you are sleeping, your brain is actually working. You also have the three main structures of the brain. So the first one is the forebrain, so that orange, um, that orange structure. We also have the midbrain here. So the midbrain is that green uh, green colored structure mid meaning middle and the hind brain 
meaning behind. So it is at the back portion of our brain. So we have here the four lobes of the brain, which is the frontal, second is the parietal lobe, third is the occipital lobe, and fourth is your temporal lobe. So the frontal lobe is um, important, especially in the formation of memory. Even our emotions, our decision-making, our reasoning, and our personality. So I have here, I also have here um, this red, this red, um, this name in red, Phineas Gage. So you read about him. He is a very important person. He is a very important person. Uh, he is a very important patient or one of the most famous patients in neuroscience because um, he paved the way in the discovery of the real function of our frontal lobe. So another function of the frontal lobe is that um, we are able to speak fluently because of this lobe. So another, um, another structure located on your left frontal lobe is the Broca's area. So it controls your facial neurons and the production of speech. So a French neurosurgeon named Paul Broca had a patient named Tan. So he studied Tan. Tan is not a real name, but the name he just coined for his patient, Louis Victor Leborn. So Tan had an impairment called Broca's aphasia. So he was not able to um, he was not able to speak and form words. And he also had a decreased motor ability. And this Broca's aphasia could be a result from, um, could be a result of stroke. Okay, so what happened to Tan is that he was able to comprehend what was being asked of him, but he could not put it into words. So, um, for example, um, I asked you, how old are you? The only, um, the only word that he could say is tan. So, how old are you? Tan. Where do you live? Tan. So they could comprehend your speech, they could understand your instructions, but they could not form words and they could not speak fluently. Okay. So the second lobe is your parietal lobe. So parietal lobe plays a major role in our senses. So it process it processes information from the sense of touch, including pressure, temperature, and pain. So we also have the term here, proprioception, which is the awareness of body parts in space and in relation to each other. So that's why we are able to, um, even if we are closing our eyes, we are able to, we know where our hand is located, where our right and left hand, left hand is, where our feet, we know it because of proprioception. So another lobe is your temporal lobe. So the temporal lobe plays an important role in, um, in hearing, taste and smell. So on the other hand, we are able to comprehend language because of 
the temporal lobe. It is also important in information retrieval. So memory, so our memory and memory formation. So still under the temporal lobe, we have the vernix area. So in other books, they call it vernicase area. So we stick with vernix area. So the vernix area is located on the left temporal lobe. It is actually for language comprehension. So if a person would have an impairment in the vernix area, we call it vernix aphasia. So here at the bottom. So a patient may be able to produce speech but cannot understand the speech of others. So um, for example, I ask you your name. So what's your name? The answer there would be 15 years old. Or um, how old are you? You will say, I love you. Because you cannot understand the, the instruction or the speech of the other person. But you are able to talk. So there, that's the vernix aphasia, which is totally different from the Broca's aphasia. So remember, um, Broca's aphasia, you are able to comprehend the speech of others, but um, you, you cannot put it into words. You cannot answer into words. But when we say vernix aphasia, um, you are able to speak, but you cannot understand the speech of others. So um, let's try to go back to the main structures of the brain. So with the forebrain, we also call it as the neocortex. So forebrain or the neocortex. So we have here, so under this one, we have the cerebrum. The cerebrum is the largest and most complex part of the brain. It is actually coined as the seat of complex thought because most of our mental activities would happen here in the cerebrum. Again. So we have uh, we have here um, the cerebral cortex. Practically, they are the same. They are the same, or it is also the same with the cerebrum, but it's the outer layer. And so the cerebral cortex is the outer layer of the cerebrum, which is responsible for the sensory information. So here, the sensory information is processed. Okay, so our cerebral cortex is divided into two hemispheres, the left and the right hemisphere. So this, uh, the middle portion of the left and right hemisphere is your corpus callosum. So that is their connection. So another important um, structure is your midbrain. So the midbrain is where your emotions and long-term memory is formed or being processed. So under the midbrain, we have the different accessory structures. So the first one is the reticular formation, which allows a person to sleep undisturbed and prepares the body for urgent stimuli from the environment. So that's why even if... Um, even if there are a lot of things happening around you, if you are asleep, you cannot be disturbed because of the reticular formation. Second is the thalamus, in which the sensory information passes through before reaching and uh, before reaching and being processed by the cerebral cortex. So. Um, it relays the different, the different um, sensory information to the different parts of uh, the body. So another is um, the hypothalamus, hypo meaning under, so under the thalamus. It is responsible for the 
production of body's essential hormones, which governs in the regulation of the basic biological needs like hunger, thirst, uh, sex drive, and temperature regulation. So it maintains the homeostasis in our bodies. Homeostasis meaning balance. So number four is your amygdala. Amygdala is connected with aggression. So its role is in learning fear responses and processing other emotional responses. So remember, fear and aggression. Number five is the hippocampus, or it is for the formation of long-term memory. So here's a big picture of different parts of the midbrain. So for the last structure, we have the hindbrain. So it is also referred to as the brain stem. So it is behind, um, it is at the back of our brain. So it contains the first one, which is the cerebellum, the blue structure here, this one. So it maintains body balance. Second is the pons, this one, which join the two halves of the cerebellum. So it is responsible for the coordination of muscles and integration of movement between the right and left halves of the body. So we also have here the medulla, which is responsible for breathing, sneezing, hiccups, coughing, and maintenance of heartbeat. Okay, so we move on with the left brain and right brain theory. So this um, left brain, right brain theory endorses that one side of the brain is dominant over the other. The description of the tasks per hemisphere are accurate. So the left brain is for language, logic, critical thinking, numbers and listening, and your right brain is for recognizing faces, expressing emotions, even creativity. But um, this theory tells us that the other, the other side has an exclusive control over a person, which makes it um, questionable. That's why until now, it is considered as a myth. So, it could not be, it could not, um, we, we could not say that a person is, um, is practically left-brained only or a person is right-brained or right-brained only. So it is unsupported by scientific evidence and is considered as a myth. We cannot say that a person is purely verbal and a person is purely visual. So both hemispheres work together they engage um, most tasks engage both cerebral hemisphere so we cannot say that it's only the other part that works so we are already in the last portion of our discussion so we have the brain related disorders the first one is amnesia it is the loss of memory, but it is not accompanied by other mental difficulties. So basically, amnesia is caused by brain injury and trauma. We have two kinds of amnesia. The first one is retrograde amnesia, which is the impaired ability to recall past events and previously familiar information. So you cannot remember anything before the injury. So we have here um, a classic example of Perlene Griffith Barwell. So he, she forgot everything and everyone she had known for the past 20 years when she got to an accident. So he did not, she did not recognize um, her husband and children. So remember, retrograde amnesia, you cannot remember or you cannot recall the past events or um, other familiar information that you have learned before 
that is retrograde. But when we say anterograde amnesia, it is the loss of memory occurring after the injury. So you cannot form new memories because your hippocampus was damaged. So one example here is Henry Molaison or Molaison. So he he was 27 years old at that time when his hippocampus was removed to stop epileptic seizures. So after the procedure, after the after the the operation, he still believed that he is 27 years old after two years of operation. So as you can see here, the difference of retrograde and anterograde, in retrograde, they could form new memories. They could not just remember the past. But for, ret uh, for anterograde amnesia, they could not form new memories and they are stuck in the past. Just like um, uh, the classic movie, Fifty First Dates, if you are, um, if you have time, you can watch it. It's a very good movie, which would um, give you an idea of what anterograde amnesia is. So the second disorder is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD. It is actually a neurodevelopmental disorder. Um, it is related to uh, brain development that causes hyperactivity, impulsive behavior, and attention problems. Okay. So third is autism. It is classified as one of the pervasive developmental disorders of the brain. So the three, the, there are different types of symptoms. So for example, um, you have an impaired social interaction. You do not know how to interact with people around you. You have problems with verbal and nonverbal communication aside from not being able to communicate well. You, you, are also, you also have limited activities and interests. So that is autism. Number four is dementia. So this is a general term for a decline in mental ability severe enough to interfere with daily life. So one classic type of dementia is Alzheimer's. You have a difficulty remembering recent conversations, names, um, or even events in your life. And the later, in the latter part of your, of your Alzheimer's disease, it could include confusion, behavior changes, and difficulty speaking, swallowing, and walking. So practically, you will not be able to remember how to swallow food, how to walk, how to speak. So that is Alzheimer's. And then we also have the Parkinson's disease. It is a progressive degenerative neurological condition that affects uh, so it affects the control of your body movements. So you will have trembling in your hands, your arms, your legs, your jaw, and your face. You have a stiff limbs or trunk, very slow in moving. You have an unstable posture and difficulty in walking because you are trembling, you are shaking most of the time. So it happens when the neurons that normally produce dopamine in the brain gradually die. That's why we do not have a control with a control with our um, with our movements. So next here is stroke. So it happens when a blood clot blocks a blood vessel or an artery and interrupts the blood flow. And we also have here aneurysm. So it is a common disorder caused by a weakness in the wall of the brain artery. So a rupture of a cerebral aneurysm is very dangerous. It could cause sudden death and recurrent bleeding. And even it can, uh, and it can also cause death.
Okay, so that's it for module four. I hope you learned something from it. Thank you and good day.